Welcome back to the Fantasy Hockey Podcast. Now, before we get started, let's address the weekend preview really quick. Uh, we recorded it, and it, it went well, but Brandon's audio had some weird kind of robotic-y thing going on, and we didn't want to put it out. We don't want to put out bad quality out there. So we decided not to release it. So instead, we decided to go really hard for the week preview this week, and we're going to be, like, you know, banging our heads just everything you can think of um, when you think of a fantasy hockey podcast going hard. We're going to be doing all of that today. So without further ado, let's jump into the week review. Like how I did that. See, no, I, I told don't. you we are I going don't even so know what I'm going to do as far as going hard. But... Going so hard. I told you we're rhyming already. Rhyming in the first minute of the episode. Man, I mean, come on. That's about as hard as we get. Uh, <laughs> so for the first part of the week review, I'm actually going to go over something that I had mentioned Um in the weekend preview, just because it seems fitting right now. And I know we're going to talk about this a little bit, but there are so many injuries. It's insane. I, it really is. Like it's been crazy man, lately. Everyone has been affected in some capacity. It's crazy. And so in long-term ones too. Yeah. I mean, yep. that's kind of, that's kind of it. There's a lot of injuries. That's, that's it. There's a lot more coming up in the injury report today too. Oh, just boy. a I couple down wait. with that. Causing so, more pain. <laughs> The first thing I noticed in this week review is that uh, <laughs> Jason Zucker went from 19% owned to 52% owned, which is, wow. I guess the, the secret's out with him. And this is before the two goals. I mean, really, he's only gained a few more percent since then. This was just from the, the news of the trade just blown up. Um, I mean, I, did, I have mentioned Meza as a good short-term target, so I get it for to an extent. But to see a, a, an increase of like 33% or whatever it is, in this short period of time is not a lot of speculation going on beyond the fact that he's playing with Crosby. People are just saying he's playing with Crosby. I will add him now, which I mean, I guess that I, I understand that I clearly understand that, but I think there is a little bit more to, to look into this situation before we consider him, you know, a quote unquote must add term. I hate so much, but yeah, just, uh, yeah, it, it's don't, don't think he's going to be a Gensel or something is, is what I'm thinking here. He's not going to get power play one. As we've mentioned, it would take, it would be odd for him to get power play one to say the least. So still tempered ex- expectations with him. Yeah. I, I, I agree. swear I think- this will be the last time I mention him on this episode. Actually, it won't be. It'll be the last time I mention him until the end of the episode, I guess. Wait, none of that makes sense. I will mention him in this episode, but after that, we're done discussing the Zucker trade because it's been like a week now <laughs> just talking yeah. about Zucker constantly I know we talked about him on the sit on a, if you joined us for our live stream for sit start Saturdays I also talked about him a little bit there and pretty much mentioned that one thing that was notable was that he did in fact play second power play as we expected uh the second bit that was pretty interesting to me was that that uh Crosby line with uh Zucker and I forget I think it was Simone, Simone. who played in the middle yeah, yeah. Uh, actually had the third worst Corsi four percentage um, so they weren't necessarily a great line from a stats perspective, which was kind of interesting. Whereas the Rust Malkin line was a fantastic Corsi four percentage line, the best one on the, on the team, and they were rewarded with minutes for that. And so that's something to watch as well going forward: is what happens if they don't perform, you know, from a Corsi four percentage perspective? Because Pittsburgh is a pretty good Corsi four team, um, and I would expect them to want to stay that way. And so I don't think Zucker is the one that gets shifted off. But we may see shifting chemistry there. And, and on top of that, I mean, Zucker's had such high shooting percentage all season. Um, so who knows? Maybe this is the season that it sticks. So my next bit here in the week review, my last one is I talked about this as well on Sit Start Saturdays, but I felt that it was important to talk about here as well on the show. Um, is to start thinking every move you make at this point now needs to be in, every move you make has to have some forethought for the playoffs now. Everything, everything you do. Any pickup, any drop, everything needs to have some kind of thought as to how does this affect my playoff plans? Everything you do. Um, If you're picking someone up or you're dropping, uh, you know, what I like to do every single time I go to drop or add, if I'm going to drop someone, I always now go to my playoff schedule, kind of quickly scroll through and see where they're being benched. Um, Are they a player that's getting benched a lot? Are they a person who gets me a lot of extra starts uh, and might be worth it there? That sort of thing, because... You never know if you're going to drop someone who you think might, like, let's say you have one long-term option and another long-term option that you're thinking about, right, for a single week. If you're already at the top of the table, 
you may not want to lose that one that's going to get you extra starts in the playoffs if this other one only gets you maybe one or two starts this next week, if that makes sense. Uh, so just everything you do going forward, just be sure to go check your playoff schedules and how it affects your own team composition because that's really, really important. Um, and you never know if you know a guy that you're going to add, you, you might be adding the guy and thinking, oh, he has a great playoff schedule, but then you actually check and they don't have that great of a schedule for your team. Um, so that's just really important. Just a, just a note of something to do. Um, and th that way you can start to decide who needs a short leash as well. For example, like I looked at, at my points league the other day and saw, you know what? Oh, this player has been playing really well. Um, I don't remember exactly what player it was, but a, a player was playing really well. And I went to look at my playoffs. And I was like, I, I bench them pretty much every day. Like they get me a net like two starts so I can have a very short leash with them. It doesn't matter if they've been playing well. At the end of the day, they're going to do zero for me in the playoffs. Um, and so that's, again, you can now know, oh, this player is droppable for me or this person is not. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. That actually makes me want to look forward on my team as the playoffs are coming pretty soon in our league. Yeah. Yeah, I just like it more than anything. I like it for knowing who to give short leashes to because you do find players that you might think, oh, this is a long term player. But then you go and look at your schedule and you realize, oh, my God, I'm not going to play him at all. And in that case, it doesn't matter how good the player's playing. They're just straight up not worth it from a schedule perspective. So it's it's really smart to do. Yep. All right. My next bit here is uh, Martin Jones got a 39 save shutout today. And I'm playing an inactive team. And of course, of course, they are still holding Martin Jones and have them on their active roster. Just my luck. <laughs> Long term target. Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, beyond that. Tampa Bay is finally the team that we kind of expect them to be at the beginning of the season and how we saw them during the season last season. Uh, Ten games in a row without a loss. Vasilevsky is right back into probably Vezina, not even contention, but I assume he's he's the the guy to beat for the Vezina trophy. So, uh, yeah, I don't really have a whole lot to add to that. It's just here we are again. Tampa seeming like an unstoppable force, and we'll see what happens when the playoffs come. <laughs> All I have to say to that is patience. Like, you know, we advocated for patience at the beginning. And, and if, when we did our bust watch on Andre Vasilevsky, I'd mentioned that I thought it had something to do with a little bit of system, but a lot on Vasilevsky himself as well. And if you watch his games recently through this stretch, he's way more composed, uh, way more consistent save to save. Whereas in past at the beginning of the season, he wasn't consistent save to save. And that was what I'd mentioned in bust watch. That was kind of alarming to me was, OK, something's off here because save to save. He just doesn't look the same. Um, and now if you watch him like safe to say, if he looks dialed in making the right moves, um, so whatever was plaguing him or plaguing the team is now completely off their backs. Yep. All right. I'll move us into the injury report, which is annoyingly long as I'm sure many of you are aware injuries have seemed to come really, really hard lately for some reason. Um, but on the upside, there are a few pretty popular names that have returned uh, this week as well. Yeah, that means branding commentary. Let's go. Bring it. Bring the heat. <laughs> so let's let's jump right in. The first one is Nazem Kadri, who's out four to six weeks. That essentially, I mean, it's not he's not quite out of fantasy playoffs, but he's going to be right at the tail end if he comes back, which makes him kind of an interesting guy if you're going to try to target him or something. I don't know that I would. Uh, next up, Cam Atkinson is out two to three weeks with an ankle injury. You've got Seth Jones, who's done for the season. Well, at least done for the fantasy season with an ankle injury. He might come back for playoffs, uh, depending on what happens with the Blue Jackets, but we'll see. Alexander Radulov is out again with an upper body injury. Connor McDavid is out two to three weeks with quad stuff. He had They said it was a bruise, and now they're kind of like, it's something that hurts him enough for it to be at least two or three weeks, which is real weird and real vague, considering the type of injury that it is. So that makes me a little worried. But then again, I was worried about Drew Doughty, and that didn't turn out to be much of anything, so... Hoping for the best there for those of you that own McDavid. I've never once owned McDavid, by the way. Anyway, uh, Jonathan Druin is next. Day-to-day -day lower body injury. Tony D'Angelo after that. Also day-to-day, -day, but with an upper body injury for him. Uh, Igor Shosturkin is day-to-day -day with an ankle injury. We've got Mark Borietsky, who's maybe week-to-week. -week. He's got some swelling with an ankle injury. Funny little side note. A buddy of mine uh, kind of guessed. He was like, I wonder if a, if a new dad would intentionally play a gritty game to get, you know, a minor injury and be able to spend more time with their kid. And then sure enough, Borietsky comes back for one game, plays a gritty game where he gets nine hits and three blocks and is now done for probably a couple of weeks at least. <laughs> it's just, I mean, I, I don't, I, I highly doubt that that was the intention, but here we are. Enjoy the time with your kid. <laughs> uh, 
Next up, we've got Eric Carlson, who's out for the season with a broken thumb. Uh, Evander Kane, usually I don't put um, suspensions on here unless it's significant enough enough to make it into the next week. And that'll be Evander Kane is just on the cusp there. Suspended again for the second time this season with a, for three games for the elbow on Neil Pionk. He actually just put a statement out recently about how he thinks the the uh, the Department of Player Safety has been very inconsistent this season and that like you never know what you're going to get. It's a guessing game, which is interesting. I wonder how that's going to play out. But uh, next up, Andreas Janssen is done for the fantasy season with a knee injury, although he wasn't really making a whole lot of impact lately anyway. Uh, we've also got Brock Besser, who is uh, day-to-day with an upper body injury. Evgeny Kuznetsov, who is day-to-day with an upper body injury. And that rounds it out. Uh, as far as the people departing. Uh, coming back, we actually have all three of the Lightning players, which is interesting. They all went out at the same time. They're all coming back at the same time. That's uh, Steven Stamkos and Nikita Kutrov, who are both great. And then Anthony Sorelli, who is good, but is eh, doing a little bit too much this season. And I feel like this first game back kind of showcased what I expect from most of them for the rest of the season. Uh, Stamkos and Kutrov getting two points apiece and Sorelli doing not much of anything. Um, obviously that's kind of pushing it a little further than I'd like, but I do think that Sorelli has been a little bit overblown lately. Uh, next up, Victor Olofsson came back, uh, hooray. The weird thing th- about Olofsson coming back is even more so than Mantha, who also returned. I hear a lot of Olofsson comparisons to just about everybody who's like hot ish right now to Bjorkstrand, to, to Zucker, to, uh, Rust to uh, pretty much name the player that's been good, Duclair, Armia, name the player that's been decent this season, and they're getting compared to Olafson, who's who's returning here. I like Olafson more than a lot of players out there, probably uh, more than any player I mentioned just now. Um, I really do think that Olafson is the real deal, and probably of of the of the not necessarily rookies, but of the of the people that have broken out this season, Olafson makes the most sense to me to continue it. Um. Although I like Mantha a lot too, but we saw him start to break out the end of the last season. So he is back, but Detroit's still Detroit. So I don't really know how much we can expect from him. We've got Oliver Ekman Larson coming back, who really just ruins Jacob Chicker a little bit, as far as I see it. Uh, Larson always, or Ekman Larson always seems like a player that you always expect to do better than he does every season. And he always winds up just being like a 40 to 45 point guy, or maybe even just a 40 point guy. So uh, William Carlson came back. And, you know, I didn't expect him to get top six because he was slated third line center for a while there. But it looks like Chandler Stevenson has moved over to the wing, which has moved uh, Carlson up between. I think he's playing between Pacioretty and Stone right now. Um, and then we've got Stasny between Marchessault and Smith, I think, which is interesting because that's a bit of a reversal. But we'll see how that goes. Uh, Elias Pedersen is back, which is great, but he doesn't have his line mate Besser, who is now out. So it's going to be. It looks like it's going to be lately. It's been at least Pearson, Better, Pedersen, and uh, and Vertanen, which is an interesting line. And I actually would like to see that go on for a little bit longer. And then lastly here, we've got Frederick Anderson returning. Um, you know, Jake Campbell, not, not Jake, Jack Campbell, played pretty well for the few games that he had. But uh, looks like it's going to be back to the Anderson show. And I, yeah, I really don't understand why all this hype happened around Jack Campbell because you knew he was going to be a backup goalie and that Anderson wasn't going to be out long term, but this is where we're at. To be fair, Jack Cam- or Freddie did get shelled in the first game back, so he did. He he actually has not been. He's played a couple games now, and neither one of them went well. But he's still the starter. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're still going with him. Um, okay, so let's move into drop candidates, and also uh, now I got now I got a question. Um, which when one of these days Brandon's going to do a a gritty podcast host uh, performance and get a little bit of an injury, maybe maybe damage a vocal cord, and he's just going to use it to spend time with his kid. Um, it's probably in the books here sometime soon to the Borieski move. Yep, soon. Yeah, yeah, Let's see if I played the one game. They gave they gave tonight's game, this is being recorded on Saturday, to, to Campbell, who played well again. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Ooh, Campbell is a little I, bit I, more I don't interesting. But I mean, but. <laughs> they need Freddie. If they're going to make the playoffs, they need Freddie in the playoffs. Although, yeah. I don't know. Who knows at this point? Um, okay, so for my first drop candidate here is a Montreal Canadian, Max Domi, center left wing. Shockingly, still 66% owned. Yeah. I, I had, like, can't a believe good season. he's that highly owned. Singular. He's had a, a 49. Yeah, he's a 49-point pace guy this year. He was on a 72-point pace last year, so a lot of people, I think, are expecting that. 
Um, but his shooting percentage has kind of fallen off from last year. His on-ice shooting percentage isn't as high as last year. His IPP is what really dipped. But that being said, I'm not that shocked by the IPP falling off a little bit. Last year's was high at 76%. This year, he's at 55%, so probably somewhere in the middle. So, yeah, he could use a few more points. Um, and what's really been hurting him recently is the minutes. Uh, he stuck it around the 17-minute mark. And like I've said before, um, I think I said this with Drew in as well, but pretty much the problem right now is that you have guys like Kovalchuk and Suzuki taking up and Dano and you have all Armia, you have all these guys, Tatar, all these people above the Domies and the uh, Druins above them that don't give them any room to advance. And right now, Domi is on a 21 point pace over his last 12 games played. If you look at his last eight games played, he's on a 21 point pace there as well. The only semi redeeming quality are the shots in which he has like two a game um, and still not that redeeming. And so really to me, I don't know why Domi is 66% owned. Um, he really shouldn't be. Yeah, I agree. My first one here is Jake DeBrusque. Left wing, yep, right wing, to. 43%. It looks like people have figured out the hole in the stick. So whatever's going on has stopped. The shots have stopped. The points have stopped. He's back to being the kind of gooder, good, gooder, the good streamer candidate that we've expected, but not a long-term hold anymore. So him being 43% is high, uh, although I, he still has his uses. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I, I mean, it, I got a question whether he's even using the hole in the stick anymore. He probably yeah, Maybe he's been taping it over. Yeah, he's probably been taping it over, changed up the taping a little bit. Something's wrong there. The, the slingshot effect is not working out. Uh, someone contact Bauer for him. So mm-hmm. my last one here, because you took um, Jake DeBrusque for me, is Anthony Duclair. Left wing, right wing, 32% owned. We've talked about him a lot on the podcast, both positive and negative. And even on Sit Start Saturdays, I had to answer a question about it. And so I just want to reiterate here, I am in the opinion that it's time to drop. It's time to get Yeah, up. I agree. I um, need to drop him. Yeah, I've done it in my keeper league. I've done it in my points league. I've done it everywhere I've had him. And and at the end of the day, it's not that he is not going to be good going forward. He could actually still be good going forward. The uh, There's a lot of things that point to him being unsustainably low, as I've said before. But the problem is that at this point, what you're waiting for is just not worth it. You're probably waiting for, at best, a 50-point guy. And his shots have kind of fallen off a little bit. His minutes have really, really fallen off. And so really for me, there's just not anything to really wait for on Anthony Duclair. And for that reason, he's just not. And on top of that, like I've said before, I don't think it's smart to hold a player that's going to sit on the wire. Like you're taking on all the Duclair risk. No one is going to grab him if you drop him right now. And so there's no reason for you to be holding. Um, So he should absolutely be on the wire so that the wire takes all the risk and you can get a player and just pay attention to see if he turns it around. I don't think he really will this season. No, I don't either. My next one is Andre Palat, left wing, 48%. Um, yeah, things have finally come back to earth with him. I feel like that whole line with Palat, Sorelli, and Johnson are coming back to the the earth a little bit. Um, they, they're, they're, I'm, the I'm not trying to like badmouth them or anything. I'm just saying somehow all these players were a little bit too relevant from a fantasy perspective than kind of what's expected of them and, and where they should be. Uh, that line was over-indexed in pretty much every capacity for a while there. And now we're now they're kind of like relaxing back to what we'd expect. Palat, I still think, he, he's similar to, to Brusque for me. In like a good Tampa week, Palat, Sorelli, those types of the guys I'm looking at as maybe a, a potential pickup. Even Kalorn, if I'm looking for power play points. Um, but I don't think they're long-term holds anymore. And Agreed. my last one... My last drop candidate is a 90% owned player. What? In Pecorine. I think Saros took over the spot. Uh, huh. I really do. He's been playing majority starts for a while now. And the one time that Rene got in there, he got shelled out and replaced. So wow. at this point, I think it's Saros' net to lose. And uh, and he's been he's just been playing better. He got the shutout against, um, I mean, the Islanders haven't been super consistent or anything, but any shutout's going to make you, you know, increase your odds in favor of the coach. Um, and and he he's done that. You know, you look, he's basically, he's been involved in six of the last six games, Soros, that is. And the game that, that, uh, that Rene got pulled in, he played a pretty good portion of it. Soros got a pretty good portion because it wasn't super long in that Rene did get pulled. So I, I do think it's Soros's net now. Um, I think we're going to see him get 
above 50% of the starts, maybe like a, you know, 60, 40 or 65, 35, even split. So, and you're looking at Soros is 15% owned and just been, especially lately been playing quite a bit better. Wow. I mean, I'm yep. surprised that you would mention him, but I'm not, I'm not against it. Actually. I think that, I feel like at, at, at best at this point, you know, they're already Rene is not a young goaltender. Everybody knows no, that no, no. he's one of the older starters in the in the league right now. And Soros is the up and coming. He's supposed to be the future of the, of the franchise. So you're looking at a time now when Soros is the one stepping up and there's no reason for the Predators not to give him additional starts if he can manage. It just makes it, sense. So I feel like the upside of Rene now is, is a is a split, which is not good. And he's not playing great anyway. So why do you want to split that's not been playing great all season? So I don't know if it's just because like I've been listening to Billie Eilish a little bit today and I'm feeling a certain oh, no. kind of way. Or Wherever if, like, you're going with on, this, on, I don't want to hear on. it. I listen to me. I need to I need a vet for a second. I need someone to listen to me. This is this is important. <sighs> Would it be crazy to drop Bobrovsky for Saros? <laughs> I traded for Bobrovsky in my dynasty league. <laughs> don't say things like this to me. It's just crazy. I'm so over Bobrovsky, man. I like. I would I'm drop so Rene for Saros in a minute. I get. I mean, yes, but Bobrovsky, I you know for sure he's gonna get the guaranteed start. I just so, yeah, but the problem is he gets me guaranteed negatives because he's a hack. Yeah, I mean, it's I just, don't know that I would do that, but the closer we get to the playoffs, the more likely I would. Be. I don't thing. know that I'd do it now unless I really needed to shake things up. That's where I'm at. I'm at the top of my league with Bobrovsky getting me negatives. There's, I don't see an upside. He's inconsistent as hell. I'm really close to dumping. I am. I can, love. Can we play a I, sound so clip close. of you talking about how great how Bobrovsky is like the number two in the league? Yes. <laughs> the yes. Of the season. I'll, I'll find it and add it in. Damn it, man! I'm I had so, the, I had the oh, good early calls on on goaltenders God. this season. That's not supposed to happen. No, it's not. I mean, I. Yeah, it's just crazy. I mean, Florida in general has just been so inconsistent. And it's been so frustrating. I mean, when you look at Bobrovsky, like the averages, so I'm just, I was just looking right now at my points league. UC Saros on the season is averaging 2.42 fantasy points a game. Bobrovsky is 2.14. For reference, Mark Strom is at 4.23. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Saros was, didn't start the season out well either. Exactly. So that's the you thing. Look at like, the last you look 30, at, I'm sure Saros looks a lot better. Yeah. Oh, here you go. Last 30. Here are my four goaltenders, right? You see Saros, five points average over the last 30 days. Yeah. Uh, Jacob Markstrom, 6.4. Carey mm -hmm. Price, 5.24. Sergey Bobrovsky, two. Kill me! <laughs> <laughs> death! It's absolute, it's death. I mean, Jesus Christ, man. It's it's brutal. Um, And I, I don't know. I, I'm just thinking out loud here. I'm, I'm very close to doing it because come playoff time, like if Bob is going to be this inconsistent, there's a very high chance that I bench him 95% of the time in the playoffs because I can't trust him. And I can't trust the Panthers. And just not worry about any of your fantasy teams anymore. I could just delete my account, delete the podcast. Actually, just leave the podcast, bequeath the podcast to you. Um, I'll go live on some island somewhere. Yeah, just maybe I'll, move to Belize and get off the grid. Yeah, I'll invite Bob you. to come with me. It, it'll, it'll, maybe it'll make him feel a little better. Um, anyways, so there you go. I like the Saros call a lot, to be honest. I have been eyeing him, and I really don't think he's going to last on the wire. I'm shocked he's lasted on the wire this long, considering we not been like, like a cupful, which I is mean, a 14 person pretty deep league, like this week. Dude, Jack Campbell got picked up in like two seconds. Yeah. Why is Saros still there? Somebody spent That's 40 bucks get. on Zucker. I know. <laughs> but Saros was free. I got him for like a dollar. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> he's available in so many of our leagues, too. It's just, it's wild that he's still out there. I mean, he's available in six of my leagues. It's yeah. insane. I think people are um, looking at the, you know, Saros is not exactly a household name, so they open him up and they look at his season average, which is like a 903 or something. Yeah. Not really looking at what he's been doing recently. Yeah, it's not. It's it's really weird. Um, I, yeah, it, it's just odd. It's very odd, but I would absolutely grab him. I think he's probably one of my favorite ads of the week because if he really does steal starts and become the starter going forward, I mean, that could be huge in the playoffs because Nashville is a pretty damn good team uh, when they want to be, when they try. It's kind of like Florida. Okay, now let's move into long-term targets now that I took us on a little bit of a tangent. But you know what? I think a lot of you will enjoy my Bob Payne. So um, there you go. I do. Enjoy it. I knew it. And remember, and you said you didn't want to hear where I was going with that. You should be happy I still to continue. I'm still <laughs> upset that I did hear it. But. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, you'll like this one, though. So for my first long-term target, um, it's really easy. Victor Olsen, left wing, right wing, 
55% owned. He is the real deal. There's nobody to contest him on that top line spot. Nobody. Yeah. Skinner was the only one, and Skinner is a bum. Yeah, I mean, he didn't get up there when Olofsson was out. They put VC yeah. up there, which is bad. Yeah. I mean, and VC <laughs> is not touching Olofsson. <laughs> No, I mean, Olsen did only play like 17 minutes in his first game back, um, but I that's wouldn't be too enough. worried about that's, it. That's a good amount. I it's think. still enough. And he still got, got some shots. So I, I wouldn't be too worried. Um, I think Victor Olsen, like you said, is the real deal. I think he's going to find his groove yet again. Um, I, I, yeah, I like him. Speaking of Olsen, just, just feels low. in the context of other rookies, I feel like this is one of the best seasons for rookies in a long time. Oh, yeah. Like you look at yeah. look at how well they're all doing. You've got uh, you've got Suzuki out there. You've got Olsen. You've got Hughes. You've got Makar. Let's just forget about Kako and 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 Hughes for a minute, Jack. That is, but there's a lot of exciting rookies this season. Um, I feel like I didn't expect to see that many. Yeah, and you have Elvis. At least and not Nett. those names. You got what? You got a lot of. You got Elvis and Net. Oh yeah, and Samsonov and Shesterkin for that matter. Yeah, Samsonov. You've got Shesterkin. There's a lot of good rookies coming. There's a lot of youth being injected into the NHL, mm-hmm. shooting its At straight all positions. The veins. It's interesting. Yep. Yep. Um. Anyway. My first one is Tyler Toffoli, left wing, right wing. He's only 9% owned. Uh, I know he hasn't been amazing or anything lately, but he's quietly putting up pretty solid and like noticeable numbers. He had a hat trick tonight, which I'm just noticing. Hooray. <laughs> so uh, that, the wow. Colorado, the stadium series just ended. It looks like Toffoli had a hat trick. Glad I picked him up. Um, and Francis and on five shells. shells. Yep. <laughs> Great. Poor um, Francois. Yeah, I think that I think he only gave up one and it was an empty netter. But oh, uh, you're um, right, you're right. Yep. But yeah, so Toffoli's been skating a lot of minutes. I mean, he's playing like 19, 20 minutes lately. Uh, you have to assume there's a trade coming, and I, I would assume that's going to be positive for him. His shots have been really, really good lately. Really good. If you go look at him, the fact that he's shooting this much with this type of ice time. Uh, it makes me surprised that he's still on the wire. I know that the there hasn't been a ton of scoring, but I think after this hat trick, we're going to start seeing him getting picked up quite a bit, especially in anticipation of the trade. Yeah, you just assume will happen. Yeah, I mean, especially after this game, he just increases trade value. So there you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my next one here is someone that you really love. I know you really like this guy, Zach Hyman. Yeah. Oh no. Toronto center left wing 30% owned. Now I'm surprised he's only 30. I'll give him I'll give him that. I, I expect him to be 50. Me too. I'm shocked. Um, but there's some interesting things happening here. His minutes are up to a consistent 20 on average for the last 30 days. It's 11 games now. Um mm-hmm. that they're up there. Uh he's on a 75 point pace over those last 11 games. Now, mind you, there is a lot of unsustainability there. Uh his shooting percentage is ridiculously high, but of his and five five of his points. Five of his 10 points are goals, and he has a 30% shooting. So there you go. That's high. So that's the one thing that's not so hot there. Uh, but he does have a pretty in-line on-ice shooting percentage. Um, he's not. He's gotten a better power play percentage recently. So over the, those last 11 games, it's at 33% of the team's power play time. But he actually, in the last seven days, has gotten 54%. So maybe that might be with Nylander being out, which is yeah. affecting that. Yeah, he did um, play top power play with Nylander yeah. out. But either way, I really like Hyman. I think he's a he's a really interesting option going forward, uh, especially if he can keep those 20 him. minutes. Because even if you look at last, so last season he averaged 17 and a half minutes, just about. If you look at the whole season, this this season, he's averaging around 18 and a half minutes. And recently he's at 20. So that's the thing that I really like. If he can keep those 20 minutes with good line mates, mm. I don't hate the idea of him being a decent option. Mm. Mm-hmm. For points, at least, like the way I see I'll mention points. somebody that I like a lot more who's lower owned right Let's now. See. I, th- I think Tyler I Yamamoto. Yep, I have him too. There you go. Right wing, twenty four percent. Ever since he got that top power play assignment, he jumped. A- well, it's more than just that. It's more than the top power play assignment. It's really the increase in minutes that gave me the most. You know, we we mentioned forever that he was unsustainably high because he was shooting once a game for fifteen straight games and was skating like thirteen to fifteen minutes a game, which is just not. You can't really put up consistent, unless you're Verona, apparently, who can do it for some reason this season. Typically, you can't put up anything with those types of numbers. Um, But now we're seeing him skating 18, 20, over 20 minutes even, and on power play one, where he is succeeding with with dry sidle. So everything's pointing to a guy to to hold on to, especially the fact that he's willing to throw the body, um, which is surprising given his frame. But this is is where we are. So he's he's really exciting to me rest of the season. Um, At least... 
until McDavid gets back. We'll see what happens then. But I mentioned this, I don't know if it was last episode. It may, it may have been the, on the weekend preview that didn't come out. But I think when McDavid comes back, I don't think it's a guarantee that Yamamoto is going to be moving off that top power play. I think there's a good chance it'll be uh, Chase on or whoever else is filling in the fourth spot to be the one to move off. So I, I'm actually pretty high on Yamamoto regardless of McDavid's situation going forward. Hmm. That's interesting. I, and I don't entirely disagree, to be honest. Plus, yeah, I, I like, like saying his name. Yeah, it's fun. Yamamoto. Yeah. It's just a fun. It's not a normal NHL Tyler name. Tyler Yamamoto. Yeah. Like it. Love it. Into it. Do you have so you have one more long term target? I'm guessing. Yeah, um, you know I'm okay. just gonna like off the side mention Sorrow. So I didn't write him down, but we've already talked about him. 15 yeah. percent owned, probably gonna be Nashville's starter or one A ish player, getting a little yeah. bit more of the starts. Um, worth a look if you're looking for a goalie. And then lastly here, a player that I feel like a lot of people would expect to be showing up on sustainably low or on drop candidates or something, as he has been on this show before. Dominic Kubalik. Left wing, right, left oh. wing, right wing, thirty three percent. He is also playing top power play lately, and he's also seeing his ice time increase. Now, I don't like him as much as Yamamoto because I just don't think it's a guarantee that he stays top power play. But this has been a kind of a long time coming. Um, volume shooter that's basically just been waiting for his opportunity here. Uh, he did show up, obviously, as we all know, pretty well with with Taze for a while, and has, has since cooled off from his crazy goal streak, but seeing him on top power play is something to be at least a little bit excited about because that that's going to mean an increase in minutes. And that's been the one thing that, that Kubelik has translated into fantasy points pretty well, whether that means literal points or just increased shots. We're still seeing him shoot like a crazy person. So him being able to shoot like a crazy person on the power play is a, is a pretty good benefit for him. Yeah. I like that quite a bit. Not a bad one. I'll give you some, some decent, uh, some decent long-term targets there for you. Well done. Very proud. Yes. Okay, moving into the week preview. So let's talk about the schedule. Uh, Team scored was... in the first, by the way, of the Did game really? that's going on right now against Calgary. Oh, look at that. Mm. It's like he's listening to you. Mm-hmm. Wait, the other way around. You listen to him. Okay, whatever. Somebody listen so, to somebody. Somebody listen to somebody. It went through the grapevine. You know, it got there. Uh, so teams with four games are going to be the New York Islanders, the Anaheim Ducks, the Colorado Avalanche, St. Louis Blues, the Arizona Coyotes, the Florida Panthers, the Los Angeles Kings, the Pittsburgh Penguins, the San Jose Sharks, the Washington Capitals, the Winnipeg Jets, and the Vegas Golden Knights. And teams with two games are going to be the Vancouver Canucks. Um, sucks for those who own Besser, or well, Besser, obviously, but Pedersen and Pearson, Vertan, and all those guys. Uh, teams that play three off nights are going to be the Islanders, the Anaheim Ducks, and Colorado, and they're all early week games, which is nice. So, taking into short-term targets, there's pretty obvious ones. Well, I, I want, one more thing I want to say about the week. Okay. This is a, a weird week as far as what an off night is. Um, I think you could pretty reasonably consider every every day except for Saturday an off night because even our like on nights were, and, and by the way, we consider an off night as opposed to, I don't know why this started happening, but it seems like instead of actually doing the math, um, everywhere just calls Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday uh, heavy game nights regardless and, and everything else is an off night. Not the case. Uh, it just usually is the case, just not this week. So this week, uh, Sunday, Saturday, and Thursday are technically heavy game nights. And for us, that means half of the teams are playing or more, um, which means there's going to be at least eight games going on. Uh, So on Thursday and Sunday, there are exactly eight games going on, which is usually pretty good. Odds are you're not going to have to bench on those days unless you're kind of unlucky. Saturday, you may have to bench. But for the most part, this is like the best streaming week that there is, kind of. (laughs) <laughs> I say th- I say kind of because it's good in that you can cycle and know that like you can kind of pick up whoever you want to maximize your starts and get like good value back. But on the other hand, it's not like you're um, saving yourself from benching anybody most likely. So to yeah. really take advantage of this week, you have to be pretty active in cycling out your one or two um, bench spots kind of a lot to make up the the difference in just holding on to whoever you have. But um, there's a lot of flexibility as a result. Yeah, agreed. And, and I mean, I think the nice thing is that there's just so many teams. There's three teams that have off nights this week, which is great. Um, and on top of that, also, because it's a week like that, it also means that it's a week that you can take some liberties and maybe add for the week following or start adding for playoffs. Um, for example, for me, I play the number, I think it's like the fifth seed or something like that the week after. I, this week, I play a really easy team. I play a 
bad team or a good team the week after. And so this week you can pick up one player that's good for this week, gets you a net three or four starts, and then you can pick up someone for the net the following week or start to focus on the following week and you don't really lose starts at all. Um, so that's an interesting option as well to think about um, that helps out. So starting off with this week, let's go into short-term targets here. And the first one that I'm going to talk about is Anthony Beauvillier, center left wing, 22% owned. Hasn't been great in his recent two games, but he does have three off nights. Um, and I don't hate their schedule. I, th I think it's pretty good this week. So I like Anthony Beauvillier quite a bit. Um, probably one of my top targets for this week, just from a schedule perspective. And following that up, um, same team is Josh Bailey here, who left wing, right wing, 14% owned, kind of in the same vein. Yeah, I don't, I don't like Bailey at all. But for points, he's decent. He's a good upside bet for points in, um, in leagues that count points mostly. Like all of them, every league? I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My first one is Jacob Silverberg. Right wing, 18%. Hasn't been fantastic lately, but I actually like Anaheim's schedule, and they play the same schedule as far as on games as the Islanders do. So there's, you're not going to have to bench, most likely, if you pick somebody up from Anaheim. Uh, and 18%, I, he's getting the best deployment that's possible on that team, which unfortunately isn't saying a whole lot, but um, I do like him. And then next up here, I've got, I'm basically picking from teams that have, um, that are playing at least four times. Cause I really, I assume for the most part, except for maybe, like I mentioned Saturday, the, uh, the off nights probably don't matter all that much, but, uh, the next one I'm going to mention here is, is, uh, Zach Sanford center left wing. He is 17% owned and he just keeps scoring. Uh, he he just keeps scoring, and St. Louis has a f not the worst uh, week. I mean, they do have to deal with uh, Arizona and Dallas, but they've also got the Devils and Minnesota, who are both teams you can score on. It seems like lately, so could be more goals for him, just like he did tonight. Yep, I actually had Sanford as well. Um, I liked him quite a bit, and he stood out as an option for this week. And my last one here for me is going to come from the Anaheim Ducks, and that's uh, Jakob Silverberg, right wing, 18% owned. I don't like him much as an option, to be honest, but he gets his shots. He has a decent point upside. I did he's just mention a lot of him, minutes. by the way. Did you really? I can Yeah, he's my that. first one. I didn't hear him. I mean, you went through like 10 million players. I went through two. Okay, so you took all my players. Okay, I guess I'm done. <laughs> I, guess I'm, I guess I'm done. I'm tired. Uh, I'm tired. Bob has me feeling a certain kind of way. I'm about to. Pick I've got Saros. three more. So let's do relax you for a minute. Really? Okay. Okay. So I'm uh, not done. I am done. Brandon you is are not done. done. So You're stick done around for Brandon's good takes. Yes, I am. Um, my next one here, and I mentioned him. Oh wait, I mentioned him on the week weekend preview, which also didn't come out. So I get another chance to mention him, and that is Barclay Goudreau. If you if you're in a banger league, he has been one of the better hitters in in a while. And because of the injuries going on over there in San Jose, he's getting more minutes than he probably should be given his pedigree. So he's kind of a, a stat filler, a Blake Coleman type lately. Uh, but there is a little bit of point upside there. I, I basically consider him the same as I'd consider like a, a, a weaker version of Blake Coleman, essentially. So if he's available, he might be worth taking a look at. He, he goes a little bit more hit forward than, than Coleman does and kind of gives up shots as a result. But uh, I think he's got some value in leagues, especially considering the Sharks have a pretty easy, very easy, actually, lineup of, of games this coming week. They're, they're home against Florida, then they have, then they play the Devils, the Rangers, and the Islanders. Um, so not so bad for them. Uh, next up, Jason Zucker. It's a good week to give him a shot. As much as I hate his ownership, it's not that I hate the fact that he's, you know, owned. It's just that I think that when you see somebody jump that that high, it means that he's getting so much more focused than any other player at his level. And I think there are plenty of players at his level or even above that are that are going unnoticed. Uh, that said, 50% owned. He's left wing, right wing. He's got a, an, another pretty good schedule for him playing uh, Toronto twice and then Buffalo and the Caps to round things out. Um, he's going to depend on whether you can slot him in. He technically plays all three of the heavy game nights, but like I mentioned, Thursday and Sunday are not really heavy. They're only eight games played, so you can probably factor him in. And then my last one here, from Columbus, playing actually a very good schedule of Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, 
is Andre Burakovsky, who has taken over the top left ring at at least at the time, uh, and has taken Kadri's spot on top power play. Uh, 50% owned. He went from being last week, I actually had in my notes as the most dangerous pickup lately because of his lack of ice time and his lots of points he's been getting. But of course, every time I mention how a player is not sustainable, something will change to make them sustainable and make me look stupid. The thing that changed is Nazem Kadri went out and then he got a line shift. So he's playing with the top line and his minutes basically went up by like 30 or 40%. So <laughs> and now he's going to look good. And now he's he's switching into a short term target, um, may even turn into a long term target, depending on how this all plays out. 50% on though. And that's it for nice. me. I am done now. Well, you know, I'm done. So how about you take us out of the show? Sure. Uh, yep, that's that'll take care of it for the week 19 preview. 19. We're getting pretty wow. deep into it. You know, in, in the 20s is when all the playoffs are going to start. We have our playoffs starting on the 20 week 21. So we're really only two weeks away, two weeks away from from our, our first playoffs in our first league. Um, I assume most of you are probably starting three weeks from now, maybe even four. Hopefully three, because if you're starting four, that means the final week is going to be on the last week of the season, which is not good. Mm -hmm. So most most playoffs will be starting three weeks from now. So good luck. Uh, Go ahead and plan ahead for that and get ready. And thanks for listening. Yep. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 